Okay, everybody, let's get started. Let's uh, stand for the pledge, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. President Daly. Here. Vice President Schwartz. Here. Trustee Hammond. Here. Trustee Parr. Here. And um, okay, well, it's so nice to see so many faces in our board meeting. Um, I want to start tonight by um, inviting uh, Trustee Margaret Parr to just speak a little bit about the National Honor Society dinner that uh, she was just attending. It's a big honor for our students and for our school. So that you can. So it was just a lovely night. We had about uh, 50. Juniors and seniors, most of them were juniors, which is the normal way to go in, but there were a couple of seniors this year for different reasons um, that came in this year. It was a lovely evening. They had dinner by themselves. Uh, and then the proud parents get to come in for dessert, and they have a lovely little candle lighting ceremony where each student goes up to uh, the microphone and, and explains um, how they feel about the National Honor Society in terms of one of the four um, pillars that it's based on, which is service, community, leadership, scholarship. and scholarship. So it was a lovely night, and congratulations to all of them. It was, um, we were very proud of this class. We have three of them right here. <laughs> uh, we have a full night ahead of us, so I'm just going to uh, get started with um, inviting Mr. Brent Harrington and um, Ms. Renee Curry, Ms. Danielle Pack McCarthy, and Ms. Lisa. How do I say your last name? This is Luna. Did I say it right? Sikluna. Okay. Um, they're going to be presenting to us. It's a Holiday and Wellness Committee um, endeavor, the um, character education program. So hit it. Um, Brent just ran up real quick to get the presentation. Oh, good. He'll be on his way down. So that's important. Um. <laughs> I could just pass these out to the board here for a moment. These are the. Thank you. I think they're online as well. But. Does anyone, um, should I pass these to the people in the audience? Or did you guys want them? We have it online. Yeah, no. Right? It's the same. It's the same, yeah. yeah. Okay. If you want to add that, it's a little more detailed. A little more detailed, okay. Yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So let's, uh, let's move to number two here while we're waiting for Brent. Um, the Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES Student of Distinction, Ms. Sophia Trena, is here. And um, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bowers and the Westchester Putnam um, BOCES representative to speak about it. Yes, yeah, so we have um, the, a member uh, from the Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES, and they contacted us and said that we have one special kid here, so we wanted to <laughs> recognize her. So we'll hand it to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Steve Lowry. I'm the executive. Oh, just go right to the microphone. Please. Oh, okay. I have a big mouth anyway, so. You know, it's so, we record this for the people at home. Uh oh. And so, I know. So <laughs> people are watching you at home, and this is so that they can hear the. Gotcha. What you're uh, good evening, everybody. My name is Stephen Lowry. I'm the executive principal at Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES Tech Center. And first of all, we'd like to thank the Board of Education for having us here. It's really an honor. We have uh, over 1,100 students that come to our tech center each day. And, you know, we only select one student of distinction each month. So, Sophia, come on up because I want to embarrass you a little bit. <laughs> Okay, Sophia here came to us, and I'm glad I'm up and you're down, so at least that the height <laughs> way is a little bit even. But, um, you know, Sophia started taking some courses in her sophomore year at FIT and realized that fashion was her true dream. And we're fortunate at the Tech Center that we do have a fashion design and merchandising program, and Sophia is one of our star students in that program. When we put this out to say, you know, who are the students that really stand out? Who are the real leaders amongst our tech center? 
Miss Tobin, her teacher, didn't even think twice and said Sophia meets that criteria. She says her work is meticulous. She's a classroom leader. Her peers look up to her, and her work ethic is tireless. And Ms. Tobin and all of us at the Tech Center are very proud of Sophia. And again, we can't thank the board enough for sending her our way, her parents for being here tonight and giving her the encouragement to come to the Tech Center, and Mr. Alm, who's a great supporter of us as well. So on behalf of Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES, we'd like to honor Sophia as our student of distinction from Haldane, and we have a few little gifts for her. Not to embarrass her too much. And this is a big week for her, because by the way, it's her birthday come Thursday. <laughs> so. so what we have here is a certificate of achievement, and it's signed by our superintendent, Dr. James Langloy. And we also have a medal of honor, if you will. And of course, it's not going to cooperate. <laughs> I'll let you slip it around because my luck, I would, uh, since I'm on camera, something would happen. So <laughs> break the glasses or something. But anyway, let's give Sophia a big round of applause. <laughs> and Sophia, we're very proud of your work that you do each and every day. And we know you're going to be very successful as I know you want to go into fashion merchandising and you're going to make it. You're one of those ones that are definitely going to make it. So we're really proud of you. Congratulations. Thank you thank you thank you so much congratulations Sophia um, okay should we we should go into our character education now you've made us wait for it we're ready terrific so good evening everyone I have uh, these fine three fourth graders of the highest utmost character uh, to begin our presentation with the character pledge. So guys, if I can turn it over to you, and maybe if everyone can stand. Go ahead, in front, over that way. Maybe to the mic, do they want a microphone? Here. Do you guys want to? <laughs> Introduce yourselves first. Okay. Um, my name is Tracy McCarthy, and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Camilla McDaniel, and I'm in fourth grade. My name is Percy Parker, and I'm in fourth grade. I pledge to be a force for good, good wherever I go, I go and, and a positive role model, model in my community. As a student at Haldane, I will stand up to bullying and treat others the way I want to be treated, with kindness, consideration, and respect. Thank you, guys. So that is our character pledge which we begin every morning, right guys? Mm -hmm. Following our Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, so I wanna set, start by saying that this evening's presentation is really the culmination of a lot of hard work on the Wellness Committee, which has uh, largely been led by our middle school principal, Mrs. Sniffen, so I certainly wanna acknowledge her, uh, as well as all of our parent volunteers and our teachers who have spent a lot of time uh, working on our character education plan. And we have two parent representatives who are with us tonight, Danielle McCarthy and Lisa Cicluna, as well as our school social worker, Renee Curry, uh, who will be presenting as well, uh, as well as our student representatives. And if you have any questions for them following our presentation, by all means, they're, they're ready and prepared to, to field any questions. So we have our Haldane character education plan. Uh, and what you're gonna hear tonight in part is a reflection of pieces of our culture and district that are systemic, right? So our character pledge that we say every morning, our second step curriculum, uh, pathways to success in the high school, our mentoring program in the middle school, those are uh, pieces that are part of the institutional fabric and culture uh, of Haldane. And then in part what you're gonna hear is just other examples that reflect the culture that really defines our character and our uh, growth as students uh, here at Haldane. 
And finally, I think it's worth mentioning, I, we have a quote there, the time is right, the time is always right to do what's right, uh, the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, and I think our presentation this evening on the heels of Martin Luther King's holiday uh, is certainly appropriate. I don't think there's a, a greater statesman who brought uh, you know, character to the consciousness of, of all of us here as, as Americans. So with that, and my clicker, okay, what is character education? We're really looking at character education as two components, social, emotional development, <clears throat> and a growth mindset. And when we think of social, emotional development, there's certainly a number of adjectives that we can use, but empathy, tolerance, kindness come to mind. Uh, and those are words that you just heard and are reflected in our character uh, plan, or excuse me, our Haldane character pledge that we say every morning. Uh, and those words are also uh, displayed uh, nicely in our uh, first and second grade hallway wing as well as upstairs in our third and fourth grade hallway. Uh, and then in part it's about a growth mindset, that language that we're using with students, that students are using with one another that really builds that sense of resilience, perseverance, and optimism. Okay, a lot of work around, a lot of conversation around Carol Dweck's work mindset and really instilling that perseverance and resilience with our students. So, why is a plan important? Well, in essence, a character plan reflects the culture of our district here at Haldane, right? It provides a living document that represents the many artifacts that signal and reinforce our collective social norms and beliefs, okay? And that's really what our plan is. It's really a living document that reflects our culture, our collective beliefs here at Haldane, some of which are part of the institutional fabric and some of which are less evident in uh, some of those institutional norms. Okay, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Ms. Cicluna, Lisa Cicluna. Uh, so uh, currently I'm a parent of a high school student and a middle school student, student, and I've been able to see the character education program come to life throughout the elementary years, the middle school years, and the high school years. And what I think is so great about it is that it doesn't exist in a single classroom or just as part of a unit. The character ed program really has developed a culture um, on the Haldane campus and hopefully beyond. Um, so we've um, gone through the schools and taken some pictures just so that you can see um, um, some of the messages that our students uh, get to see. Um, they uh, try to highlight the different um, aspects um, that we think is important, such as compassion, kindness, empathy, um, and recognizing that we're all part of something larger than ourselves. The messages um, that the students get throughout the years grow in complexity. So it starts off as kindness counts, grows into understanding what um, really encompasses respect, problem solving. And by the time they get to high school, um, I can see that they really get a great understanding of what it takes to be a good citizen. Um, Danielle, uh, right? Um, we'll talk about uh, some of the programs that uh, exist K through 12, and um, we can see that it's it's not um, so isolated. Okay. Um, we, um, Mr. Harrington spoke about artifacts throughout the school that are uh, that are present, and these really are living artifacts that the students see and the teachers see and parents see when they're, when they're in school for many volunteer opportunities. And we, we've listed some of them here. Even coming up with the list, we kept adding on and adding on, realizing how many of these things really fall under character education and social emotional health and building the growth mindset. So I thought um, we could just kind of look at some of these. If the board or anyone in the, the audience had some questions about some of the programs or projects, we can answer some of them. In the meantime, I could talk about a little bit about uh, PTA's Gang Up for Good Committee, in which I, I serve as the chair. 
And this committee, when I took over, originally when um, it was first developed, it was very much an anti-bullying committee. And um, this is something that my predecessor also worked on making it more of a positive committee that focused on prevention of, of those kind of behaviors by focusing on character education. And this is something that we've worked on as part of the PTA in conjunction with the school. And it's been, I can say, for the past two years serving as the committee chair, it's been such a, an amazing thing to be a part of because it's not a group of parents pushing these ideas on the school administration or faculty, but very much interwoven throughout the fabric of uh, Haldane and the culture of Haldane. And so many times the ideas for um, the character pledge sprang from uh, parents, but then also full support of and, and administration seeing the need for something like that for the students to start their day speaking about the, the character um, traits that they wanted to exemplify uh, throughout the school. So um, that's been a really that's been a really important part of this whole process is seeing how it's really the different parts of the community taking uh, taking part in this. And uh, something that Renee Curry, the school social worker, took on was uh, the idea of monthly character themes. So taking our second step curriculum another step further by really pulling out the character themes that, w that we wanted our students to understand each month. And so they're in alignment with the themes that they're learning through their second step curriculum. And so, and uh, the fifth grade students and uh, Mrs. Curry take part in announcing these character themes every month. So the students are not only reminded by their classroom teacher, but it's, it's, it's remind you know the students are reminded every month over the loudspeaker of these traits that um, that they that they are focusing on in class, and that kind of brings me over to the shared language that is used K through 12. And and Lisa spoke a little bit about this, seeing the connectiveness between kindergarten all the way through high school, and when you have these programs in place and the students are learning about these character traits, it really does become the shared language that's used not only in school but because there's there's things that happen at home and there's crossover if there's parents that need to speak to each other. And this has happened to me as a parent, um, real experiences that there's, there's common language that could be used when you're speaking about an issue that your child's encountering or maybe a conflict that your child's having with another child in class. And th that shared language really um, is important. And so it's nice to, to know that other parents know um, where your child's coming from and where these kind of, um, these character traits that Haldane in so many different ways is, is promoting. So if anyone had any questions, um, we have uh, the high school principal, elementary, and middle school principal here. Um, and I guess maybe questions at the end or, or now. Otherwise, I'll pass it on to Mrs. Curry. Okay, so we wanted to focus a little bit on Second Step, which is our research, it's a research-based program that fo focuses on social and emotional well-being, health. And Second Step is happening K-8 in our school. Um, teachers have taken it on. Our peer mentoring group has taken it on with our eighth graders. And Second Step focuses just what that slide says right there on four key points. So empathy, problem solving, emotion management, and skills for learning. And then there's lessons that incorporate each of those themes. In the middle school, they keep those four themes, but they add substance abuse prevention, bullying prevention, goal setting um, to, to part of the curriculum. So I kind of wanted to highlight two things that I think are really important when I think about Second Step. There's a lot to highlight. Um, but for tonight, one is the structure of the lesson. So um, K, K5, when we do it in the elementary, um, it's, it's done in the same fashion. So the kids will um, come together as a group. There's a review of the lesson from the prior week. Um, there's a group activity, so all the kids are engaged working together. And then they come back down and they sit and we talk about what's the theme or what's the lesson going to be for that day. The card I have here is conflicting feelings. And I brought the card because K3, the, the discussion piece is done with a, a picture card like this. And on the back are some key points and questions to kind of foster conversation. Fourth and fifth grade, um, there's a video, there are little video clips to talk about a certain topic. So the kids kind of get the information in, in that way. Um, so not being a
for myself being a social worker, I thought that this was really great because it hits all the different types of learners. So you're working together in a group for that hands-on experience. You're talking together um, in group and then you're doing, most times you're doing an activity with a partner. So you're um, working there doing a worksheet or something like that. The, the picture card is visual or the video is visual. Also there's a couple of songs that go along. There's a song about empathy. There's a song about calming down that are very catchy, um, right? Stop, name your feeling. Um, and so the kids kind of, for those, those kids who love music, um, that kind of hits them because anytime I say empathy, um, most times a kid will start singing a piece of that song just by me using the word empathy. So the lesson itself hits all, hits all the different learners. And again, for somebody like me, that was really, that was really helpful. Um, another highlight of Second Step is the home link. So as I described, kids will work in partners and do some work together. We come together and we do a wrap up. But that at the end of that lesson, there's a worksheet that goes home very similar to the worksheet the kids did together. And that's for mom, dad, grandma, whomever, guardian, whoever you live with to work with you on that sheet for homework. So there's our carryover right there. They see what the children learned that day. They take a look at the language the kids are using here at school. Um, and they work together and it's kind of fun to have mom or dad or grandma sit down with you. And then a parent, guardian will sign that and that comes back to school. Having piloted the program, I got to see those, those lesson, those homework sheets come back to school and what a nice job kids did working with mom or dad or, or grandma. Um, so when we kind of started the rollout for this program, I was lucky enough to pilot it in fourth grade and then I moved to third grade and then I moved to fifth grade. So I saw how engaged these students were in these multifaceted lessons um, and it was a lot of fun for me to get into the classroom and it was a lot of fun to watch them grow and learn and, and use this. And we talked today, um, the three students sitting in front of us, about you know learning these things and trying to apply them. And sometimes on the playground you might forget, right? Or, or in the middle of a disagreement you might forget. But for the most part, they're holding on to it and they're using it. And so that's, that's really great to see. So. Thank you, Mrs. Curry. So that leaves us with, with kind of like the final question, right? How do we know that our character plan is working? How do we know that Second Step and all of the other uh, wonderful initiatives and, and uh, components that have become institutional in our building are, are working? And I think really the best evidence is anecdotal. For me as the, whoop. For me as the principal, it's best measured when I go outside at recess when you all don't know that I'm standing around watching. And I can observe and see that our students are engaged in appropriate play, that they're able to navigate social situations independent of adult supervision, that they can start a game of kickball, participate in that game of kickball without any arguing, enjoy a, game, a, a spirited game of competition at recess, and then when the whistle blows, go in and have lunch with their peers and behave appropriately in the cafeteria and enjoy their lunch. You know, so there are a lot of examples that are really purely anecdotal, but really say a lot in terms of our overall character here at Haldane. Uh, I'm always proud as a building principal that there are very few, very little of my time is spent around poor choices and, and issues of so-called discipline, right? That the principal, you, you automatically assume that the principal spends a lot of their day, right, around, around discipline. And, and very little of my day is actually spent in that capacity because uh, it's very, not that it doesn't happen, but uh, myself and Mrs. Curry are not spending the better part of our afternoons sorting out uh, issues that uh, transpired on the playground because students know how to navigate and, and work those issues out on their own. Uh, and that's something to be applauded. I don't know if our parent representatives have anything they'd like to share. I feel that the character education um, program um, really has um, some responsibility also towards our high school students and the success that they're having, um, say in the um, Simon Dudar's class right now for Discover, Create, and Innovate. All those soft skills that we know is necessary for older students and young adults to be successful 
I f really does come from what's being planted at the elementary level. And um, so, I, you know, I feel that the success of this program um, is seen in the cafeteria, and it's also seen um, in the high school building at some of these really <laughs> intense classes um, when they're working together. Um, there's, um, you know, a lot more um, group-based projects being done now, and these skills are necessary for that. And something that I think of in how the character education plan is really becomes a part of the culture of Haldane um, came up last year. Trader maybe remember this, but I, it was at, at dismissal and pickup. They, um, his class was dismissed a little bit late, and um, so I was waiting. And I said, "What happened?" He said, "Oh." Mrs. Prey needed to pull us all in for a group hug. Someone was really struggling. Do you remember that? Was Prey? Do you remember that? And so, and it came right on the heels of a second step lesson. And because, and and through sharing through that um, through that group lesson, the student one of the students shared something that was hurtful to her that was currently going on with another uh, with a group of friends, and. It's a real tribute to teachers at Haldane as well to take that lesson. And it's not just, and as Mrs. Curry is talking about how, how great the, um, the curriculum is, but it really is um, the teachers, you know, do their own thing with it, which makes it really special. There's a lot of, there's enough wiggle room. And they really used a real life situation that was going on with one of the students and ended their day with a group hug with the, the teacher and the students. And, and Trajan could tell me everything about it, what happened and, and how Mrs. Prey kind of coached her through it and how all the students really supported her. So I think of that often when I think about how this really is um, really a living, a living document that reflects, you know, throughout the classrooms and hallways. Okay, so we can certainly stand up here for uh, another hour and share a lot of <laughs> stories that we have uh, as evidence of how proud we are. Uh, of our students. But again, I want to thank the Wellness Committee. Uh, we've provided a copy of the character plan to each member of the board, so you can peruse that at your leisure. Uh, and if you have any questions, if you have any questions for our students, uh, you know, they you look can like shoot. they're wiggling to sing that song. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to sing that song for us? It'll be on TV. <laughs> Pass on the song. <laughs> Are there any questions from the uh, public, parents? Does anybody, oh, does anybody have a, um, a question for our students or teachers? Well, I want to say what a pleasure it is to hear about character education. I mean, I think we talk so much at board meetings, not a, not a downer to our board, but we talk a lot about tests, and we talk a lot about money, and we talk a lot about facilities, and it's really nice to talk about character education because that's so much a part of the puzzle. Um, and as we talk about... Uh, you know, it's a hot topic right now, testing and assessments, and it's even on our agenda to talk more about that, you know, next. Um, and there's a lot of backlash about testing and assessments, and do we test too much, and do tests really tell the whole story or not? And, you know, we're always saying that at Haldane, we, we don't just look at the tests. It, we look at the whole student, and it's about the organic education of the student. And, um, and but this is, this is how we're, this is how we do it. Right. This is that intangible, tangible uh, other piece to the to the puzzle. And so when we say that Haldane isn't all about testing, we mean it. And this is part of why we're not all about testing. It's um, it's about looking at the whole student. Um, so I thank the uh, wellness committee and Mr. Harrington for leading the charge on um, the other piece of the puzzle. Any comments from anybody? You did a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, students. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move into uh, some test score analysis now. <laughs> Perfect segue. <laughs> yeah, please. Please take a moment to exit if test score analysis is not exactly your reason for being here. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bowers for this. Uh... 
Okay, so um, as you know, we have, um, for our work sessions, we have different topics, and uh, tonight's topic, actually we're going to have two in addition to the character education. One is to talk a little bit about test scores and what has happened um, as far as testing and changes with the reform agenda and some of the things that, that districts have contended with over the last number of years that are related to the reform agenda. And uh, then later we'll talk a little bit about the rollover budget. So Mrs. Sniffen, are you gonna start us off here tonight? Um, Jen really did a great job kind of um, segueing into this and I think it is really Sorry. important. No, it's perfect. <laughs> I think that's the truth. Um, it is, you know, New York State, we all hear often about 3-8 testing uh, and Regents exam testing. There are other tests that we are mandated to give by the state um, to our students. Um, but for the most part, that 3-8 testing is a snapshot. It's one measure. Um, we definitely look at it. It's not something we don't you know, just put in a closet and it, it doesn't exist, it does. Um, and so the students take it and we use it. So you'll see some of that. Um, obviously the Regents exams are a little bit different um, in the sense of that data and what that data means uh, for those students. Um, but there are some other test, testing uh, that's done here that we thought we would talk about. Uh, so with that said, um, tonight's presentation is gonna take this flow. Uh, what are the current state assessments that we're mandated to give? Uh, how do we use the information once we receive it? Uh, the shifts to the Common Core a current snapshot of the results. In addition to a current snapshot, which will take a look at 2014 and 15, we also have some longitudinal data um, that we'll take a look at kind of tracking a cohort of students over time um, through the shift from non-Common Core to Common Core to then Regents. So we have some data that can show that flow. Um, some, some of the subgroups um, and some of the action plans that we have in place in terms of subgroups. And then our refusal rates. Um, I think it's important to show that. Um, we are not on the reward school list uh, this year because we did not meet 95% of our kids taking the state assessments. Um, that definitely, uh, in the past year, Mr. Harrington and I worked on grants that we were eligible for because we were reward school. Um, that we were not eligible to apply for uh, because we are not on that, that list. Um, we had under 95% taking the assessments. So you'll see some of that. Here are the tests that we're mandated to give. Um, it might be a surprise for some of you, but um, three through eight, we do give the ELA and the math assessment. We also are mandated to give a grade four and eight science assessment. Uh, a few years ago, we were given a grade five and grade eight social studies assessment. That was removed, I wanna say three years ago now, maybe four years ago. We give the NICETEL and the NICESLAT. Um, the NICETEL is given to students who enter our school district um, who may not yet be proficient in English, and that would determine eligibility. Uh, from that, every year, if you are eligible, based on the NICETEL, you take the NICE slat to evaluate um, your progress to see if you need to continue to receive ELL services or not. Um, so that is given by our ESL teacher. Um, we also have students who take the New York State Alternate Assessment, and those students would be eligible based on an IEP um, to participate in an alternate assessment versus the um, state assessments three through eight or regents exams. Um, we also do field testing, which is how the uh, state or the companies who write the tests kind of gather their questions that they deem appropriate for the assessments. Um, so that is given uh, in May, typically to two grade levels and it fluctuates kind of every year, which grade you give it to uh, and what part of the test you would administer. So those are the assessments. And you're up. So how do we use the assessments? We being Haldane. Most importantly, we use the assessments to, to try to inform our instructional practice with students. Uh, there's an item analysis that we look at that provides us with some information to be able to target areas of, that 
the student, the child needs to work on. Uh, and then in turn, that item analysis is shared with the classroom teacher along with uh, the AIS provider, assuming that the child falls below the cut score that requires uh, academic intervention uh, as through response to intervention and some remediation in either math or English language arts. So you can see we have, uh, we review shifts in state expectations, cut scores, we look at students that fall below the cut score, we analyze the percentage passing rates, we look to see if there's any trends, cohort trends that are visible. Uh, we do look and compare uh, our performance to some of our local neighbors. Uh, again, the item analysis really provides us with more specific detailed information to help really target uh, the needs of a particular child. And that information is turn, in turn shared with teachers uh, and with parents who generally ask. It is uh, kind of a more complex data analysis sheet. So it's information that we share when we feel that, that, that it's appropriate to do so with the parent. Okay. So we have state shifts here in grades three through eight. The adoption of the Common Core, which took place in July of 2010. And then we'll see, and as, as we go through our presentation, you'll see, we'll communicate clearly to you that you can very clearly see the difference in students' performance on the Common Core State Assessment in 2013 as we made that transition from the New York State Assessments to the Common Core. Uh, in 2015, this past year, the state submitted a new uh, RFP and different vendors submitted to win the bid. Previously, Pearson had the state contract. Uh, we are, the new, state of New York is moving forward with a different vendor, Questar, who received the bid. Uh, so we're interested to see with field testing this year and computer-based field testing, it'll give us some indication of potential changes with the new vendor. Uh, Questar with the state assessments. And finally, another recent change uh, through the state regulations is no longer our state assessments being used with teachers and principals to determine a growth score. Until okay. 2020. I'm sorry? And, uh, until 2020. Until 2020. And which will get changed again. <laughs> <laughs> so that quest, quest That's like, will hold that bid for five years? Is that what you're saying? No, we're saying that the, the it's not part of the APPR. The test scores will not be part of a teacher's or a principal's. Until, until 2020. So how long is Questar, is Questar going to be hold that contract? That's a good question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I don't, I I don't know if we go out to bid again. Yeah. I'm not sure. Good evening, everybody few uh, interesting shifts uh, regarding the high school. Um, first thing is th this first bullet point doesn't really get into what the shift is in curriculum for Common Core, um, which I, I'm sure you've heard a little bit about. We could talk more about if you're interested in um, some of those details. But really what that's saying is what have been the, res the, the changes in our results as a result of the shift. And that is that um, our pass rates for algebra specifically in the first year um, remained, uh, and in the second year, we've given, administered it twice now, uh, have remained unchanged. But what, what has changed pretty significantly is the mastery rate, um, the, the number of students achieving 85% or better. And we'll show you some of those details later on. Um, for ELA, uh, or English Language Arts, um, on average, the, score, the scores on the whole are about seven to 10 points lower. So that does affect the mastery rate as well. But it's, it's almost a really, with, with ELA, it's a really consistent pattern of just a straight drop. And we had students take both simultaneously. And, and it was a very obvious pattern when you put them next to one another. It's about seven to 10 point difference. Um, the, the shifts in content, in uh, cognitive approach to learning, the algebra and the ELA, the, the, the ELA shifts are a little bit more minimal on, on a secondary level in the high school compared to what they are in 3 to 8 because I suspect that um, we were very, we were teaching in very much kind of a common core way uh, in the high school before these shifts even came about. The first, uh, we've given it to our 10, 10, 10 honors students. Um, so we have seen some results, and that's how we're able to draw these patterns. The first administration 
to the 11th graders will be um, next week. So it'll be interesting to see uh, if the pattern holds true to um, our regular non-accelerated, non-honors uh, students. Geometry, we've had uh, one administration of that, of that common core version of the Regents, and um, the second administration of that will be this June. And then uh, the third course in the sequence it was formerly known as Algebra 2 slash Trigonometry, will now be called Algebra 2, Common Core Algebra 2. The first administration of that exam will be in June. Um, as Evan will know, the tricky part about that one is we've been able in algebra and geometry to kind of administer both exams, and, and that first group of students has a shot at both exams. The restructuring of formerly A2 trig to now Common Core Algebra 2 the differences between those two are so significant that it, it isn't very easy to have the students prepared for both exams. You really have to choose one route or the other, and we've gone all in with the uh, Algebra II Common Core, and we expect good things. The other thing that's a shift from the high school perspective is that, um, you know, they, the, the state has to kind of legitimize this whole process and try to make connections to that three to eight testing. So they're beginning to give us our results um, on, a, on a four point metric, um, one, two, three, four. So they haven't, you know, I think that'll appear on our school report card and in different places. We're not really at a point where we're sharing that with students or trying to build that into the culture to get them to think about their algebra or ELA results on a one to four metric. But the idea is, um, to emphasize proficiency and college and career readiness, and the the, the you'll you'll learn a little bit in a, in a minute about um, different cut points and cut scores, and they're really what we've learned is that they've they've set it up exactly so that a three or four um, is about a 75 out of 100, and that's considered college and career ready from their perspective. Okay. So let's, uh, let's start to drill into some data. Maybe just take a moment and, and try to kind of absorb the, uh, the information there on the screen. And there should be a number of things that likely jump out at you right away. So we can see that not only do the cut scores change, depending on the grade level. But the percentile to achieve that level, proficiency level three or mastery level four, changes, and in some cases changes quite significantly. So for instance, looking at grade three, in order to meet proficiency on the math, you would need to be in the 56th percentile. But in fourth grade, to meet proficiency on the math, you would need to be in the 68th percentile. The fifth grade, 79th percentile. Sixth grade, 66th percentile. We're back up into the 70s for grade seven and eight. So those cut scores vary from grade to grade. The percentile changes from grade to grade. And that's important also from the perspective of when we look at certain cohorts and certain grade levels and performance, that we need to be mindful that those percentiles to achieve proficiency and mastery change from grade to grade. So we can't just arbor arbitrarily make a judgment that students are not performing as well with a particular grade of teachers because we need to recognize that, or, or as well as the prior year, given that the percentile to achieve proficiency or mastery may be very different. So a good question to ask is like, why does the state do this, right? <laughs> Have we answered that yet? <laughs> and what would the bell curve look like? Yeah. yeah. So it becomes a moving target. It's also important to note that determinations for AIS, for those cut scores, it's not a proficiency, it's not what is established for the proficiency cut score. The cut score is often lower than what the cut score is to meet proficiency level three, and that changes from year to year. So in other words, one may achieve a high, quote unquote, a high two on a state assessment and not, and, and it 
and the state is is communicating that that child is not in need ne necessarily of AIS. Okay, am I saying that clearly? Yes. Okay. All right, and here we have ELA. So again, you see the percentile a little more consistent at the, at the proficiency level when we look at level four mastery. And really think about that for a moment. Grade five, right? Level four, you have to be in the 92nd or grade three in the 94th percentile to achieve a level four mastery. Very different from percentages for proficiency and mastery that we saw prior to the Common Core assessments in 2000 that were implemented in 2013. Okay. Uh, just a uh the Questar got $44 million for five years. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I think Brian kind of alluded to it too. Um, as Brent was saying, you, you start to see here, this is just so drastically different than when um, the New York State assessments were being given as opposed to the Common Core. Like that's drastic. Mm -hmm. um, so here's. Yeah. Julia, can I interrupt for sure. You might be getting to this. I'm, I'm just curious as to how, how much um, emphasis is given to these scores to the students and teachers. Like, do they know? Like, do, does a fourth grader know? Oh, I've really got to get an 88, or else I'm not gonna. Like, no. are they clued into these no. numbers, or is this behind no. the scenes stuff? It's really behind the scenes, and I think the culture over the last. And these tests have existed. Um, I started here in fourth grade in 98 and 99 we were testing at just fourth and eighth grade then uh, well, we were trying to figure out the exact year that it switched but it's been 10 years i think that we've been testing for grades three through eight so this isn't really something totally new um the common core right brought on a lot of the conversations and the heated conversations about the assessments i think you'll see why when you start looking at these next couple slides for the most part I would say our population, most of our students don't know really how they did on these assessments. Um, I would say every once in a while there's a couple kids that will say, you know, how did I do on the assessment? And they'll have a conversation with the parents and then the parents will make that determination to have the conversation with their kids. Having two kids that are in the midst of this in my own household, uh, the first year we didn't say anything about it whatsoever. The next year came home and asked. So we said, all right, well, let's use this as a talking point. We sat down, we talked about it. I think here it really is one measure. And I think our parents are pretty good at recognizing we don't, we don't totally dismiss it, but we're not making big decisions based on three through eight testing. We're not, we look at five measures when we look at AIS eligibility. And most of the time, we're not getting the state assessment data until the end of August, when for the most part, most of our scheduling is done. So we're using other measures to determine eligibility for AIS. Every once in a while, the state assessments will come in, the cut scores shift, because they shift every year. We look at the cut score, we make sure we've captured every kid in AIS prior to what the state tells us. If we miss a kid or two here or there, we do and we have to adjust. And based on the state assessments, not making the cut score, maybe have to add a student in. I don't think we have ever taken a student out of AIS because they do well on one assessment. We just, that's not kind of how we function. <laughs> you know, we really look at how they're doing in the classroom. Are they making the progress on the assessments that we give here? Uh, before we take a student out. Also, Jen, um, you, parents get a snapshot mailed home to them yes. of their students. Um, and, and Brent had mentioned um, that we don't provide like the, the item analysis detail to every parent. It's so much information. You know, it's really not necessary to go through all of that. However, getting the snapshot, every parent gets that. And then if further data wants to be looked at, we can drum down and get further data. Do you use it to determine uh, going into advanced classes, like science and, and algebra? It would be one of the measures that would be used. It is by no means the only measure. Um, Mr. Harrington brought in the Orleans HANA, which is a research-based algebra readiness exam. Um, we use that. We use our Ames web data. 
We use teacher input. We use parent conversations if necessary, student grit. You know, that those types of things are definitely looked at. It's, mm -hmm. it's a measure that could be looked at, but it's kind of on the spreadsheet along with everything else. Okay, so what you're going to see here, um, the last two years of data, obviously all common core data. Um, Mr. Harrington pointed out um, some of those jumps and percentiles that you need to receive a three or a four on a state assessment. So if you look and you're like, oh, okay, well, this data looks, you know, it's not great, but, you know, all right, not so bad. Why does it go down so much? They go into fourth grade. Like, what happens? The next year, it's, again, you're comparing apples and oranges because it's not the same kids. But we know if we go back and we look at fourth grade, you have to be in the 60, 68th percentile to get a three, where in third grade you needed to be in the 56th percentile. So it changes. The target is moving. Um, another one to point out is down here. Um, this I want to say was 15 students that take the math eight. Um, a lot of our kids are taking algebra, the Common Core algebra exam. So this is just the eighth math eight exam, uh, these two numbers. And again, three and four doesn't mean passing, right? Passing is primarily within the two range somewhere. Not that our goal is twos. Our goals would be threes or fours. I'm going to go one more. Now you're looking at longitudinal data. So stay with me for a minute. This might be a little much. Um, take a look at, let's start with our current ninth graders, OK? So when they were in eighth grade, 48% of them met proficiency, three or four. It doesn't mean passing. It's that proficiency number. The year before, when they were in seventh grade, sixth grade, whoa. <laughs> Fifth grade, fourth grade. This line is the common core. So we shifted from New York State assessments without common core to common core data. It's definitely raising the bar, right? You're definitely seeing lower numbers here. We don't, this is NA, as Mr. Olm said, we contemplated putting the current 10th grade up here or not. Um, when you get to the math, you'll kind of see why they're there. But we don't have a high school English regents on them, so that's why it's NA, not yet. So next year, we can add in that data, because they're taking it. <laughs> we go to math. Same thing. Uh, the current seventh grade, of course, it goes backwards this time. That's my bad. Should go the same way. But current seventh, these, here they're in second grade. So there's no state assessment in second grade. That's why you have NA. Oh. That was me. Um, again, here's our common core. As you get to the ninth and tenth, the current ninth and tenth graders, these numbers include the common core algebra regions. So we took the proficiency rate on the eighth grade exam along with the proficiency rate on the algebra regions, and the current ninth graders, 79% met proficiency. The current 10th graders, this would be math 8 and the algebra regions. This is just the current 10th graders now. This number, 97%, would be the students who took algebra in 9th grade. They were not accelerated. So they're taking algebra as freshmen, 97% passed of the students when you go back, this number, it's those kids who how did they perform on the algebra regions? That's how they performed. 
data. <laughs> I think that's it for me. Okay. Can I ask a question? This, Julia, yeah. this might be for you. I don't. I don't know if you probably, guys have any this of us information. Could answer it. <laughs> um, so. So I'm seeing that with the, the Common Core tests, obviously scores are going down because the tests are harder, right? Would we, do you have the same data for their um, classroom scores, like the, the, te the, the grades that they get in class? Does it have the same correlation? Like if, is, just the, is the way that it's being taught, you know what I mean? Like because the classroom scores, I'm assuming, have more to encompass than just the tests, right? They have homework yes. and everything else. So are those also having the same no, I change? No, I don't think you'll see really the same change in terms of teacher grading and teacher, you know, what's going on in the classrooms. I think the skills and the things that are being taught in the classroom have definitely, the bars have been raised, the reading level of the material, the push, the, the approach to the instruction has shifted and changed. Um, I don't think you see the same level of grading um, that you see here. So the instructional model shifted, the pedagogy has shifted into deeper learning, which we know aligns with the Common Core, but the grading, you don't look at a teacher's grade book and only see, you know, 57% of eighth graders passing. One thing I want to add to that, you had said the, te the tests are obviously getting harder, et cetera, but they're also being scaled harder. Mm -hmm. So the tests mm -hmm. are harder, but they're also being scaled harder. Yeah. And what, what this presentation doesn't show you is that um, student achievement and student growth are steady. You know, there are, there are slight ebbs and flows, as with anything, and there are different cohort effects, right? But by and large, uh, you know, 3 to 12, um, our achievement and growth are, are very steady, which is probably what you care about the most out of all of this. Yeah, I mean, I but this presentation was, was designed to show you, hey, what's different in the world, right? Yeah. And we're trying to illustrate to you, you know, what the landscape is and what we're up against and, and, and how much effort it takes mm -hmm. to dissect through these things yeah. to be able to arrive at the conclusion that achievement and growth at Haldane are steady. Thank you. Another point, to bear in mind that these cut scores, we don't learn the cut score till after the fact, right? And they change from year to year. So that presents another layer of challenge. Okay, so questions around state refusal analysis. Uh, here are our numbers. I think the numbers speak for themselves. You're, you're likely to ask the question, why do we see a larger percentage of refusals with math versus ELA? Uh, and I think a fair assessment of that is the math assessment is after the English language arts assessment. So we saw a larger number of refusals for the second assessment. And we tended to see a larger number of refusals in the upper grades, five through eight, which was not uncommon from what I heard from colleagues, elementary and middle school principals in the area uh, through, our, through my network, um, attending those elementary and middle school principals meetings last year. Okay, so to pick up, um, subgroups is one of the areas that we looked at as well. And so we do recognize that we have our students with disabilities in special education and also our economically disadvantaged students who are not performing as well. And so we have put together an action plan and we've been working tirelessly since September to really implement a lot of changes in the pupil personnel department and in special ed. So we started off with a self-assessment in the department with the consultant, Dr. Donna Ryder, who came to us in December, and she has actually given us a list of recommendations and suggestions, and so we've actually been already working on implementing that starting this month. So we actually had a meeting this morning about that um, to start to roll out some of the changes in our department. Um, staff development as well, we've dedicated many days to it this fall, and we actually are planning our superintendent's conference day in April 
around co-teaching models to provide more opportunities for inclusion and how to support students better in the special ed realm. Interventions and progress monitoring as well, we're looking at software and data um, programs that can actually support that so that we can actually follow and track students year to year and share that information easily between teachers and teams and with the administration. And also our child study team process, we're looking to align that K-12 so that it's more proactive and so students can be referred as early as possible instead of in reaction to. So we're looking at making some changes in how we really roll out RTI K-12 as well. So we're actively working on all of these different action plan items so that we can see an improvement in our subgroups and their scores. Okay, so um, this is a look at, at the trends in, in the data in high school. Um, kind of illustrates my earlier point, a, 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 an easier way, I guess, to see it. Um, it's pretty crystal clear with ELA. Goodness. Um, you know, it's pretty steady and consistent across the top there, 98, 99, 92. Um, and then the first administration of the Common Core version, um, there is, whoa, that's supposed to say uh, 84. Maybe I have, we put the wrong thing up there, Ms. Sniffin. We, we swapped something out. Anyway, it takes a dip in 2015 when you go to the Common Core, and it's the mastery that takes a really big hit at that point in time. The number I have on my sheet's 84 and 24. So um, as I said earlier for ELA, things just kind of go down at about seven to 10 points. When you look at math, um, the, pass rate stays very consistent all along, even after the Common Core exam. So the, 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 they've, they kept the pass rate exactly the same. In fact, when we compared old algebra to the new Common Core algebra, um, you know, there are some kids that, that uh, maybe did a point better on Common Core and then uh, and a point worse on the old exam, and it was very tight in terms of pass rate, but mastery um, overall takes a really big hit, and you see the, the, the dr dramatic thing there from 43 to 7%. Um, and so that's just them shifting and playing with the cut scores. They don't, the, 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 to, to reinforce basically a predetermined, it's a predetermined thing. It's not even something to chase. It's just that when, what, with these results, we're going to create cut scores that give us this result, the predetermined result of, um, you know, around that many students performing at what used to be as at mastery. Um, so it's kind of like um, that's where they've moved the mastery line but kept the passing line the same. Can I ask a question on that last one with the, with the drop and the mastery? Is that, are we looking at the same kids taking that test? No, so but here's the other thing that's year. interesting. The other thing that's interesting in 2014, that that 90 and 43, I, I wanted to keep it simple. So that merges old and new. There was a, a, a one group that took the um, the Common Core algebra there. I merged the two of them just for illustration purposes. And in 2014, they didn't monkey with the benchmark a lot. It was the first year, there's politics behind it, it's under the microscope. Right. They really didn't monkey with the benchmark a lot, but 2015 is the second administration of it, they hammered the mastery rate. And I know I have a detailed analysis of this, analysis of this from Lou Sassano, and it's really the same results in between exams. Mm -hmm. It's just where they wanted the mastery rate to come out. It's just that simple. Um, and we expect the same thing with geometry this year. So in geometry in year one, which was last year, they were very kind and things didn't really change much from the old uh, to the new Common Core. But this year, we're fully anticipating to get hammered on the mastery rate. Got it. I think just one piece on that, you know, the high school kids or the eighth grade kids, either one, you know, they go in, they know their eighth graders I'll speak um, about, they go in, they know they're taking Regents exams, they know they're taking a Common Core Regents, they go into eighth grade, they take it, they pass it. But a lot of times kids aren't looking for passing. <laughs> you know, they are looking for mastery. I was just gonna say, and can so, you explain the yeah. mastery a little so more. Mastery, you have to hit 95% 85. 
85, sorry, 85. So 65 passing, 85 mastery. So you have students who go into the exams, their, their, their goal is 85. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really what they're looking for. Passing's great, but they want an 85. So they take the exam at the end of the course, the Regents exam, and they don't hit 85. What do they do? So they're retaking it, some of them, over the summertime to try to hit that 85. And this was a, this, the end of the school year, this year was a, was a big, you know, working through that. Yeah, there, there's just two, co two cohorts of kids who are bearing the brunt of this, really, and will continue to as this new system is rolled out. You have the current ninth graders who were accelerated as eighth graders that hit the second year, the second administrator of, of, of Common Core Algebra. And then you have the current non-accelerated 10th graders who are going to get hit in the second year of geometry. So those two cohorts of kids, are, are, their morale is, is being completely abused by, frankly, what is, what is state politics. So on that, <laughs> um, again, I think three through eight, we kind of take a look at this. It's one measure. It's one snapshot. Um, we use the data to inform our instruction um, as best we can. Um, and high school is obviously regents exam. It's a different conversation. Um, but if you have any questions. I just have a couple, a couple things. One. Um, so with the refusers, it's like I'm, I'm, it's, uh, I'm kind of torn because I think in, in one way, you know, all these, these people refusing has really sparked this conversation statewide. Um, so from, from that, it's kind of a good thing. But from as a board member and a parent, you know, you got to look at it from that way. So, I mean, I think like what you said today about how you use five measures and, and w I think there's just a lot of... I'd like to know why those parents chose not to have their children take the test in the sense of, when I say I'd like to know, I don't mean they have to account to me, okay? Um, <laughs> but I mean, like, if those parents came in and met with you or Brent or the superintendent personally and really had a conversation, I think you would find that you'd f a lot of those parents would say, oh, okay, I didn't realize that and be willing to let them sit for the exam. Have, have you guys thought about that or talked about doing something like that? Like calling, not calling in every parent, you can't do that, but calling in the parents from last year of the ones who didn't take it. I think per the, personal conversations. Yeah, it really varies from family to family. So we've, we've had families that we've met with that have reached out to us that felt compelled to communicate to us uh, and we certainly appreciated that communication in terms of why they were making the decision to have their child refuse state testing. Uh, most often, it, it, from their perspective, it had to do with a political statement and feeling as if uh, it was unjust and inappropriate for, te for their child to be used as a number and in turn that their performance determine in part the teacher's value or the teacher's competency with a state measured growth score. Um, so you had that perspective and that being articulated to myself and, and Mrs. Sniffen, uh, and then other families that just called the day of the assessment that their child was complaining about taking the assessment and they essentially relented. So uh, it really, it, it's unique to each individual family. You know, we certainly put out prior to state assessments tactfully uh, an encouragement to participate both the superintendent and myself did so in our respective newsletters. Uh, I received some phone calls from parents on the heels of my newsletter uh, who felt compelled to communicate to me why they were still making the decision that they were making, and I respected and appreciated that. Um, so again, it, it really varies quite, so, but quite now widely. With, now with the new, with the change of, of the teacher's evaluation not being used, maybe now, that argument now, okay, so their voices were heard and, and they made a political statement and actually worked, I mean, you know, possibly. So now, you know, say, okay, so now that it's not being used, would you now be willing to let your child, you know, take the exam? Again, no, we're not pressuring them. The motive was originally. Yeah, if, if that was the motive, then, then they, they were successful. And so now let's, let's take the test because now it's not going to be used to, to rate the teachers. 
Yeah, and, and I think that remains to be seen, right? But it'll be important for us to communicate prior to the state assessment just that, that uh, state <laughs> assessment scores are no longer being tied to a uh, growth score for the teacher and for the building principal. Right. Yeah. Great. A um, couple other things. C Brian, the, we talk about the mastery. Do, do we... <coughs> Do we look at the, the college readiness index? Does, is that something that, that we look at as far as? Yeah, there are a couple of things I left out of the presentation, which inadvertently, and one is that ultimately, I have to highlight here from a high school perspective, you know, we, we were looking at the three to eight stuff, and in the ELA and math, we're seeing these like 50%, high 50s, you know, low 60s proficiencies. Ultimately, those all translate to 100% pass rate in ELA and algebra because they have to. And our graduation rate is pretty much 100% uh, every year. Um, so, you know, these kids have opportunities, and even with multiple opportunities to take it, those exams, that's why it ends up being 100% pass rate. But even uh, without the multiple opportunities to take them, we're coming in at high 90s, you know, in both ELA and math, even on just one take. Um, we, yes, we look at mastery rate. Um, and we, we look now, we're starting to look, analyze more um, how that translates to their new metric of college and career ready, which is 75 on these two exams, which it is supposed to translate to a three or better on the three eight exams. So yes, of course, we look at that. Um, there are a couple other driving forces that kind of culturally build that in from the student perspective is that um, with English um, for junior and senior year, and even now for junior and senior year for the, our different college course options, uh, whether it's honors, English, or AP, we have two different tiers in junior and senior. Um, Albany has a standard where, that they uphold where the student needs to achieve an 85 or better um, to, to be able to gain entry to those two courses. So yes, we look at it, but that's where it's very much built in culturally for the students. We have um, 10th graders who weren't in um, 10 honors because they didn't opt to do the ninth grade honors projects to get into the 10th grade honors. Um, they're in 10 regents and they say, hey, you know what? I really wanna push myself. I just got turned on in 10th grade year. Uh, I really wanna be a student. And then they choose to take the ELA uh, as a sophomore, the junior year ELA, they take it as a sophomore even though they weren't in the 10H because they wanna jump into the 11H or even uh, you know uh, the 11 AP for that matter. So yeah, we track it, we pay attention to it, um, but and it's culturally built in there. Great. Does that answer? Yeah, yeah. Would you want to add to that, Ms. Martinez, our distinguished English department chair? Okay. <laughs> and then just my last thing, and then I'll turn it over. Is you know we, you talked about the nice lot. The, I always pronounce it wrong. Nice lat. Nicest, nicest, nicest lat exam. Yeah. And you know, I'm thinking about, and this is, I know, I know the, because it was looking, we're almost like 10%, 8, what, 8, 9%? Okay. And you know, I, I know it's very important in, 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 in all three schools. So, um, but you know, I can't remember really on the board, any, like really being presented to about the, the ELL program. Um, I think that would be something that would be interesting to kind of, Walk the board through the process and of, of taking the, the you know the, 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 the now the new categories and how yeah, you test out and then what happens when you test out. Yeah. So I, I think that would be an interesting kind of a workshop topic, a little presentation to the board, um, because I, I, that's that's probably something we don't talk a lot about here in the board. I know it's being done in the school, of course, um, but but not at necessarily at, at a board meeting. Mm -hmm. So. Does the uh, board have any questions, or does the audience um, have any questions about all of the material? I think it's really interesting. I feel like I just learned a lot. Um, and I think it's really interesting information to, um, to also just consider how much the administration and the staff is up against, <laughs> you know, um, dealing with the mood swings of um, the state education department. So I think that I like the, way you put it. The, the mood swings. <laughs> um, 
I think that's really interesting, and it's it's really. Um, I think it's something for all of us to always remember and just to take into consideration of, of what you guys are dealing with behind the scenes and therefore what our students are dealing with um, every day. Um, so thanks for the presentation. I know that's a lot of work for you guys, so it was really helpful. And I know it just scrapes the surface. I know there's a lot more. Um, so thanks. Um, I really feel like maybe we should like weave in character education songs or something, <laughs> like in between <laughs> each. <laughs> he looked like topic. he was ready. He was like, <laughs> because now we have to go into the rollover budget. He did. Yeah. Um, okay, so okay. into the rollover budget. So actually, we're going to kind of, if you don't mind, um, we have a representative from BOCES here, um, yeah. and we're going to talk about a budgetary issue that. It, we're dealing with right now, yeah. and we'd like to do that first, so Mr. Curry can yeah, I think that's a great idea. answer any questions we have and, and go home. Um, so tonight we're going to talk to you about a couple of things. One is uh, we have a budget challenge this year that was unanticipated, and um, we'll talk about that. And then we also have learned a lot of, um, from Albany over the last week or so um, about next year's budget. So Anne has done her magic and done her calculations and we'll talk about um, the rollover budget for us to use as a guide um, in our budgeting process this for next year um, but we were informed um, recently that there was a, a glitch in some of the reporting um, that occurred uh, with BOCES to the state education department and when we got our budget runs from the state we realized that the the projected budget numbers for this year were very different um, than the actual budget numbers came in. And so we were kind of questioning why there was such a differential. And um, one of the things that we are aware of is that last year during the reporting of expense-driven aids through BOCES, there were things that were reported as something that drove aid or would drive aid that did not. And as the result, we, are, we had a report that went to the state um, that said we were going to get a substantial amount of money um, the, back in BOCES aid that we are not going to get. And um, ultimately, it was about $125,000. So we are going to be in the red this year. Um, and we're going to have to figure out how to absorb that into the budget. Um, Todd Curry from BOCES is here to answer questions that you may have. It was part of my Friday reflection, um, the explanation of what happened. Um, Mr. Curry, I don't know if you want to share any information initially. If, if you would, if you'd come to the microphone, we'd appreciate it. I guess, first of all, thank you for um, inviting me in. Um, we could probably use that little song you talked about right now. We're talking about a, a, uh, an aid uh, problem. First thing I want to say is um, this is wholly my department. My uh, responsibility it has nothing to do with uh, Haldane's information passed along to us. We prepared this. I want to tell you about the life cycle of the BOCES aid. We prepared the projection for 15-16 aid and 14-15 spending in October of 14. We send that report up to the state. It projects what you're going to spend out through June 30th of 2015. It's an estimate. If you spend every penny of it, it's usually a good estimate. What happened, the human error with the calculation, what happened was, and the best example I can give you is a very simple one, and the numbers are not indicative of, of what we're talking about here, but if Haldane spent $100 on, on a BOCES program, and we said the unaidable expenditure was seven, uh, seven, $70, it would leave a $30 net aidable expense that would be aided at your BOCES aid rate. What happened was the deduction of $70 was listed at $0. In effect, you would have projected aid at $100 of aidable when in fact you really should have only gotten 30, um, aid on $30 of a BOCES expense. Um, it's a common problem because it's an estimate that the aid, the actual aid that Dr. Bauer spoke about is a little different. There are variances to it. The dimension of it in this case is what I'm here to um, apologize for, and also to tell you uh, some of the things we've put in place to make sure I don't ever have to come up here again and explain this. Well, we appreciate you coming here. It's a line of fire. But um, the, was it a mistake that happened at 
multiple districts or was it, are we the lucky? No, it, it was a mistake across the board. It affects di uh, districts in different ways because, um, you know, I was in and seat at, at a local district and, and at a time when you weren't grasping for every penny that you could on a revenue stream. So sometimes you wouldn't predict, you wouldn't put in your budget the total uh, governor's run. In the case where you do do that, that's when you, you're having this deficit when you're seeing the run. And why wouldn't you? If I was if I was in uh, the same shoes, I would I would put that that same number in. But that's why I wanted to just go back to my opening. This was not something that that came out of Haldane. It came out of my office. But it was not just Haldane. I guess the big question is: Is there a way to recoup some of this money? From proceeds. Yeah, it's a 15, 16 problem. And again, it's not dollars that you were entitled to that are not going to be coming your way. Um, we talked a little bit uh, earlier um, in the week, or, or actually last week, and tried to brainstorm ideas. But it's not like I have the dollar sitting in a fund that I could just say, okay, we, we made this error, and now you could, you could get it. It's not funds you were entitled to. It's, it was an over pro a projection of an estimate. very difficult kind of situation to be in because, um, you know, in, under normal circumstances, if we had control over it, we, we may have understood that it was going to happen, but this yeah. was just kind of caught everybody off right. guard. Yeah, and so what we've done in, in my world is we're going to involve the local school business officials in a conversation as soon as those figures are submitted in the future so that they can challenge them and, you know, another set of eyes. And then we have a few controls that we put in place on my office that my new treasurer, when he goes to submit this um, next October, will have extra eyes on it. And I guess if any recommendation could come from us, it would be to ensure that you have the checks and balances in right. place, um, whether it's this or anything else. So there are more than one set of eyes that are looking agree. at it. Agree, 100% agree. Is there any benefit to, um, we're talking about $125,000, is there any benefit to trying to find a way to split that over time well, or no? There, because it's not money that is, it was a projection and it's not real dollars, it's difficult because it doesn't exist. <coughs> and yeah. so um, we did talk a little bit um, when we spoke on the phone last week about, you know, it, could we pay a BOCES bill off in two years as opposed to yeah, just... Yeah, that's what I'm asking. I guess. That's, I mean, that's a possibility, but we're going to still be in the red. And if we right. can figure out the way of making it through this year, that would be the preference. So we're not taking this mistake into another year. Okay. And so we have a, that may be a conversation later on when we're trying to figure out how to make this work and with all the other things that we're going to be looking at and calculating. Um, that may be something that we call BOCES and, and ask if there's a possibility. But if we can deal with it now and, and hopefully have a 4% fund balance at the end of the year, that's what the preference would be. Gotcha. So I, I'm just, because I don't even know if a lot of people understand. So we we, we owe BOCES $125,000 more than we thought? No, the BOCES, when, when we get the state runs, they give us a year for next year. They give us an idea of how much money that we're, we're going to have in state aid that comes to us. Right. And so what happened is BOCES basically said that we were going to get $125,000 more in the projection than we actually got. Right. So the money never existed, but we used that line to budget from. And so the state says, this is what you need, to, this is what you should anticipate getting. So there's always a little bit um, that of, of wiggle room there, and you need, need to know it's not always going to be on the dollar but it's not usually overemphasized to the point that it was. And so we looked at the number, we took it at face value, we used it in the budgeting process, and it really should have been $125,000 lower. So we have to figure out something now for this school year. Right. And you know, through we, the end of June, we are where to come up with that. We're talking about potentially freezing the budget at this point, um, probably in early February which would decrease the amount of spending that the district will go from February 1st until the end of June, and hopefully be able to absorb and recoup that way. 
Um, and then we'll have to look at some of the trends with uh, special education students and outside placements and some of the other things um, that we're, we see happening and, and hopefully we'll be able to absorb it. So we can put some things into place like freezing a budget and then we'll have to look at other things. And what exactly does that mean, freezing the budget? It means no one else is, no one's allowed to spend any more money on anything? Well, the things that are already requested and are in the pipeline will go. Um, unless it's, if it's something that we don't need to buy this year, unless it's an emergency or it's something like graduation where we have, you know, it's something that we are gonna have to expend money for, um, we don't. And basically it's saying, let's wait and if, if unless it's an absolute, absolutely essential, um, we're not going to accept additional requests for funding. And if it is absolutely essential, we'll do it. But right. if there's a way of, of uh, absorbing some of that, that would be a, one of the options right now. Okay. Any questions? Um, more questions? Are we good? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. Okay, so okay. now Anne is going to share with us her thinking based on the projections for next year. And we do have a projection, um, just as we did last year, of how much state aid we're going to get. Um, we're also going to talk a little bit about the gap elimination adjustment. If you saw the state of the state address, Last week, you would have seen um, the governor was talking about returning the GEA, and at this point, Haldane's GEA is $220,000, and we, um, from his discussion, we were hoping and anticipating that we would have the $220,000 in GEA back, um, and we got 67. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in, that's going to put a little twist yeah on, on what we're gonna have so Anne's gonna sh talk about um, if we did a rollover which means if we have what we have now in the district if we, we we replicated exactly the same thing next year how much would it cost us so okay. Stinio. it's not going to take um, as much brain power as test score analysis yeah. to understand the rollover budget um, a lot of people just aren't even <coughs> fond of the rollover budget, but you need a starting point, and this is our starting point. Um, so, you know, as Dr. Bauer has already pretty much gave us a definition of a rollover budget, so that's good. Um, we have some preliminary information, um, and then the summary of what it is, and then we'll talk about um, our budget parameters as we kick off budget season. Um, what the board would, would like to see us uh, focus on. Um, so what's a rollover budget? It's a starting point. Um, as Dr. Bauer said, based on contractual obligations and everything else that we know that's going to increase, what would it cost to operate the, the school district next year with our current offerings? And from this starting point, um, we take staff and program changes and um, any other changes in, in the law or it mandates and um, mold the budget for the next school year plan. Here's some preliminary information that we know that our health uh, insurance premiums are going to increase at two and a half percent. Good news is that the teacher's retirement system and employee's retirement system um, those percentages are both decreasing in 16-17. Um, um, as we, we heard earlier, for our state aid, our governor's executive proposal, um, he was uh, letting everyone know that our state aid is increasing, but really it's just a decrease in what they're keeping from us. So really, not an increase, it's a hidden increase. And the foundation aid is at zero. The foundation increase. aid is flat, and really the only increase in that uh, executive proposal is the, um, the fact that we're getting some gap elimination mm -hmm. money back. Um, the consumer price index is a big part of calculating the property tax cap, 
And um, that's not out yet. That should be out by, by our next board meeting where we're going to talk about the tax cap at that time. Um, it's, it's not really um, going to be encouraging to talk about that. The CPI is anticipated that it will be quite low, and that will also um, keep down our ability to um, increase the tax levy. And just as an explanation for people that may not know, that the tax levy increase is calculated by either 2% or the CPI, whatever is lower. And this year, the CPI is lower than the 2%, so that will be used in the calculation. <coughs> So our um, rollover budget is uh, $444,322 higher than our current 1516 budget. So th that, um, based on contractual obligations and known increases, um, it would be a 1.94, is that what I said, 1.94, yeah, percent increase over um, this year's expenditures to operate the, the school with the program and the staffing that we have right now. Um, this, obviously, I'm not going to read all of the numbers to you. This is the rollover budget by category. Salaries, um, the larger benefit line items, um, debt service, interfund transfers, BOCI services, and all other, which are contractual and supply lines. Um, and what this really um, hits home when you start drilling into the numbers is that salaries and benefits um, make up over 76% of the entire budget. So there's not a lot left over um, for other for other things, other program changes. Um, just to reflect on last year's parameters, um, they are the parameters that the board had set for us in developing the budget, and we were able to um, to stay with all of those parameters. All of um, all of that was achieved, and. Um, considering that we probably want to stay in the same vein. Moving ahead for the 16, 17 parameters, um, really everything I thought we would want to stay the same, but if not, just let me know. I'll take some parameters off if you want. The only thing that I did take off was um, opting out of the teacher's retirement smoothing option, which we're doing this year, so we don't have to um, have that in our plan going forward. That's it. Okay. Questions at this point for Ann? So a 1.95% one, a 1. increase, what would that calculate? Like as far as, because you say the tax cap is going to be probably less than 2%. So what does that, what does that translate to as far as what? What type, would that be a 1.95 increase? Not necessarily. I do not have all of the components yet for the calculation so to um, to calculate the tax would it be cap. Close within two percent. Like are we like, like how far? Like how is it within? You know, I mean, how is this really far? Historically, our tax levy increase in our tax rate has followed the um, the increase in the budget okay you know budget to budget um, because most of our our budget is is a tax levy um, but I think what if we can give you a total guess because we don't know um, what the tax levy increase is going to be we're probably I'd say maybe a hundred and fifty <laughs> to two hundred thousand dollars away from being even so we're going to have to look at some unique strategies in the budgeting process and look at different options to bring that as close together as we can um, correct me if i'm wrong but the uh, budget development parameters that the board created last year there's the checkbox here for expand improve website communication 
That was kind of part of the technology directive, but we were just pulling that out as like an earmark to say that we really mean it about that one. Um, and to my knowledge, that has been in, that has been encompassed into the uh, position that Leah, uh, technology integration specialist, right? Mm -hmm. She is leading the charge with our website and will be updating it and designing it and improving it. And so that that to me has been checkmarked, right? Like that was is something that we have budgeted for. It's been paid for. It's in process. And next why, year, yeah, I guess I'm asking why is it still here for this coming year? There's actually going to be a savings because the the website that we're creating right now is in Weebly, which does not have an annual cost. Mm -hmm. But the website that we had in the past or have presently that's going to sunset. Um, actually has a charge. So there's actually some savings that's going to be coming to the district by creating a better website. Great. So it's kind of a win-win all the way around. Right. So I guess I'm thinking I that can be taken off of the budget parameters. Certainly. Yeah. The reason okay. why I kept it on was because um, in my mind taking control of it we can expand it even further than it is right now. It's not just going to be that we're going to take the existing information on the website and gain control of it, that it can just grow bigger and bigger. But um, Maybe this is I can take that a question off. for another night. But when do we expect this improved website? Do you know? Well, we actually had a presentation last week of the comp of different components within and so Leah is is building it and there are many different parts to it that are presently under construction but if whenever you're ready we can give you a kind of a view of what we've done now um, it, it will probably be spring before we launch it um, and then we have a lot of things to kind of shift over and there's some changes that are happening but actually it looks really very inviting, I have to say. It's a very different style, a lot of pictures, a lot of things that um, help to celebrate who we are. So great, great. it's coming. Um, yeah, so I mean, I don't know, unless I'm missing something, that to me seems like that's, that's being paid for okay, by. It's off. Okay. Is it off? Great. The, the numbers that you used for this, um, the big numbers page, did that take into account or did, or did you do this before the BOCES thing came up as an issue? The BOCES issue affects the 15-16 right. school year. So that's, so on this page where it has the BOCES, the final budget for the 15-16 where it says BOCES services and it's a million two mm -hmm. and then the rollover budget is a million two seventy. The increase is 69000 So are we looking at that $120,000 in there somewhere? No, this is um, this speaks to expenditures, and the 125000 is on the revenue side of the budget. So the, it's going to be within this year, hopefully, and so it won't have any impact on the 1617 budget. So the answer is no, it's not in there because we hope to deal with it within this year's numbers. So this final budget number of 1.2 million for BOCES, this is an expenditure. And the $125,000 that we're talking about having to freeze the budget for, yep. where, where is that in relation to this? We're gonna have to take it as an expense, right? some way, form, shape. Right. We're going to have to reduce an expense to match a reduced revenue. So this is going to be 1.2 minus $125,000. No, the $125,000 in reduced expenditures for 1516 may not necessarily come from BOCES. It might be other areas of the budget where we will find cost savings to reduce expenditures. Oh, so it's not directly linked to BOCES in, on this page at all? It's not. Okay. Other thoughts, questions? This is a to be continued 
kind yeah. of situation. Yeah, sure. <laughs> for, the, for the salaries, and did you build in, you know, because we do have some retirees coming in, so we anticipate, like, did you build in the, the, the savings already, or is that? No, that, that, that would be in the would, um, first later. proposal, oh, okay. right. Yeah. A rollover so is yeah. the existing staff. Okay. Okay, so um, the board can, can you know, look at these pr the budget development parameters, see if there's anything that's missing there for any of us um, or could be changed as we move ahead. And Anne will keep us updated. Um, are there any questions from the public about the budget presentation? Should we bring the microphone to you? Make you feel good. Good to see you, Zoll. Welcome back, Michael. Yeah. Nice well, good to be back. Probably one day stand. Um, just a couple of questions. I've been out of the loop for a while, and the medications I take make me forget a lot of things. So, um, foundation aid is used for what again? The general expenditures of the district. It's the. So, and you're the, getting zero for that, right? Well, zero increase. Zero increase, okay. And um, the gap elimination, you're getting a decrease of 67000 But So, what is that actually accounting to what you're getting in? What you so, what they do with the GEA is they tell you how much state aid you're going to get for the year, and then they take it back. Okay. And so. Once they tell us how much we're going to get, um, this year they took back 220,000. So the year before it was more, and they kind of, and they kind of piecemeal give it back to you. Um, so we anticipated originally that we were hoping to get the whole 220,000 dollars back, which means that they wouldn't yeah. give and then take, um, but they're going to take 150,000 and okay. change. And so um, instead of getting all of it back, we're getting 67,000. Um, they're going to continue to take after they give us our bottom line, 150,000 from that. OK. Um, and what contracts are due this year? HFA is due next year, right? Yeah. HAA and CSEA are due this year? Correct. And um, if the way the stock market's going right now, can TRS change um, from um, 11.5 to 12 percent can no, it change? I believe it's been it's it's solid for next year. So because it, it'll affect next year's, it won't affect what Correct. it is this year. Right. And um, CPI CPI last I looked it was like a 0.5, so that's gonna you you're most likely gonna be heading down that road. Obviously, I know it's just a rollover, but yeah. so your number is gonna be going down that well, way. Well, we anticipate that the um, tax levy increase will be below two percent with all the calculations. Yeah. And we do have a little bit of a growth factor, which will help us. Yeah. But until we know what the CPI is, consumer yeah. price index, we can't do the calculation. Yep, yeah. yep, yeah. okay. Tomorrow. All right, thank tomorrow. you. Any other questions? Okay, I think we can move on. Um, can should we maybe move on into the um, information reports? Um, do we have any student representatives anywhere? They're hopefully at home sleeping. <laughs> um, okay, so um, Mr. Harrington, elementary school principal. All right, three trips to the mic tonight. This is maybe a record for me. Uh, Let's see, I will mention that our elementary school improvement team is starting to do some research around a FLES program in the elementary, FLES being foreign language in the elementary school, uh, looking at that, recognizing that there are budget constraints, that there's uh, scheduling constraints, uh, certainly not for next year. Uh, at the earliest, it would be a recommendation for the 17-18 school year. Uh, so we've solicited some expertise of some of our parents, Julissa Tomazawa, our PTA president, as, as well as Kevin Gogler, who is a professor of Spanish uh, at Marist University. We're looking forward as we move into the spring to schedule some uh, time with other elementary schools to observe respective programs that exist in the area uh, and then move forward from there in terms of our work next year. 
Thank you. Great. Ms. Sniffin, middle school principal. Um, I'm happy to say I have to use my sheet to read all the award winners for the Gene Saunders contest. Um, we had every seventh grade student participate this year in the Gene Saunders contest. Um, on January 11th, we had the award ceremony. And I am pleased to announce that we had four students who took honorable mentions, uh, Calvin Shuck, Andy Sucluna, uh, Andrew Selhavy, and Patrick Reinhart. Uh, we also took second and first place. Uh, the second place winners were Arden Coney Bear and Shannon Ferry. And Jack O'Hare and Carlo Cofini were the overall winners. Uh, they came in first place. So we are hoping to get their presentations to be able to display them in the middle school, high school library, if anybody would like to come see them. Um, but we are very proud of their work, along with Miss Anisi, uh, who really worked hard uh, to get all students this year to participate in the contest. So congratulations to all of them. Great. Mr. Am, um, high school principal. Thank you. I'd like to use my information report this evening to uh, highlight the achievements of Ali LaRocco and Cassie Trena. Uh, I should have really kind of jumped in the flow earlier. Cassie was here with her sister. Um, they both won uh, the Poetry Out Loud competition this year, which is really, I think we're in our third or fourth year, and has really grown to be a fixture of the culture of the building um, due to the great work of uh, Dr. Richter and Ms. Martinez uh, and, and the other English teachers who really support that work in class. Ms. Martinez in particular uh, does a little mini poetry out loud in her class in a different context. So it, it's safe to say that every student will graduate howling, have, reciting prose from memory, which I think is a pretty big thing uh, and, and an important skill. Pardon me? So, um, you know, th that's kind of a big deal when we talk about the different skills and, and what we do well beyond uh, the world of testing. Uh, we're really proud of that. And um, Allie and Cassie were uh, one, uh, two of, of 12 that participated this year, and uh, they'll be headed to New Paltz on February 10th. Ms. Hackett. Hi, good evening. So as mentioned earlier in our test assessment presentation, we have an action plan um, for our special service students. So we are actively working on that. We are excited that we just got back Dr. Ryder's report. So we're rolling up our sleeves now and really looking at those recommendations and how to start to implement some of that work into the classroom and across the district. So we're actively working on some of those initiatives right now in the department. Also, we had our first career day. Um, our department actually is getting an audit this this year um, on indicator 13 from the state and that will be happening towards the end of the school year so proactively we're actually um, having all of our 8th through 12th grade students do a career assessment and so that information is going to be infused into their IEPs and then that information will then in turn really help students to identify post-secondary goals and so th we feel really confident that we are going to do really well in the audit that we are taking all these um, proactive steps and preparing for it so the department has really been great about allowing us to push into the class and into resource room to do the career days. And all the kids went on myplan.com to do the assessments, which actually has um, a career interest inventory and also a personality assessment, which is really neat. So if you want to log on to myplan.com, you can do an assessment on yourself um, and find out if you're all in the right careers and interests and what your personality <laughs> profile is. Um, mine actually. I don't know at this point. Yeah. So it was very insightful. I'm in the top four of my of my career choices, so that was very insightful. So anyway, we're doing a lot of great work um, and moving the department forward and, and change, which is great. Thanks. Great. Mr. Salem. Good evening, everyone. Um, I wanted to start by thanking our Boys and Girls Basketball Association for help raising over $1,800 for the American Cancer Society last week during our Coaches versus Cancer Day. Uh, special thanks to Chantel Lizicados and Sharon DePaulo for organizing and working the event. And thank you to everyone who just came out and donated to a great cause. Um, we've talked a lot about numbers tonight, so I'm going to continue with that trend. Uh, these numbers are going to be a little more positive. I wanted to give uh, a special recognition to our indoor track team. They're having a tremendous season, and throughout the last several weeks, our both individual and team members have broken several school records. So I'm just going to read them off really quickly. Um, on January 9th at the Coach's Invite in Staten Island, our girls 4x400 meter team 
broke a school record and finished fifth overall. Um, the team consisted of Ashley Haynes, Ali Sharpley, Ruby McEwen, and Marina Martin. Um, and then last week at the Yale Classic on January 15th, um, our boys uh, team of Nick Farrell, Brian Haynes, Kenny McElroy, and Theo Henderson uh, broke the distant medley relay, knocking nearly 12 seconds off the previous school record. Uh, also that night, Ali Sharpley, Maura Canesites, Heather Winnie, and Ruby McEwen uh, also broke the 4x800 relay, uh, knocking nearly 16 seconds off our school record. And on the same night, to finish it off, Ashley Haynes, Michaela Catabox, Adele Westerhouse, and Marina Martin ran a 1, uh, one minute, 55 seconds, point one six race in a 4x200, beating the school record by nearly two seconds. So congratulations on their success. Uh, I wish them continued success. And track's an interesting sport because they don't always get the same kind of crowd and the same kind of uh, publicity. But we do want to recognize their accomplishments and all their hard work. So continued success in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Twardy. Good evening. Um, over the Christmas break, we did get rid of those, uh, the bad tree in the south part of the school by the elementary. Uh, the other tree that was a little bit damaged, we cut off the bad branches. Uh, where it was supposed to be cable, we just cut that limb off. So now we have all of the dangerous trees off the property. I'm sure more are going to pop up over the next couple of years. It's a continuing program. Um, I'm pretty proud of my maintenance staff, uh, in particular this time Mike Lizakatis and Jeff Pallas. They persevered and got the high school art room kiln going. It took a while. It's been down for a long time, longer than, than I've been here. And um, we did a test on it the other day. It's working, and so now that could add to the art room uh, curriculum. Uh, I met with uh, Carl uh, Fresinda the other day. He's the Phillipstown Highway Superintendent. And just to continue our relationship, that's where we get our salt from. They, we just pay a, a bare minimum price for the salt, and we just uh, pay for what we use, and we only use what we need. <laughs> uh, we go up there. Uh, and we get it in the morning of the, of the day that we need it. We never store it and use, uh, let it sit here and get wet and not use it. So that's a good deal to continue with them. I also want to thank Murray uh, Prescott, my uh, bus mechanic. He's keeping the fleet rolling good for the last two months. He's had 100% with DOT, and that's just his typical record. He's uh, keeping the fleet going. And... That's it. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to move into the superintendent's report. If anyone wants to sneak away, you may sneak away. I won't be insulted, I promise. We won't take it. We won't take it personally. <laughs> Okay, um, the first item on my report is the gap elimination adjustment, which we've really talked about already. Um, and so we have a minimal amount. I think Ann is um, very positive in the potential that you're hoping we're going to get a little more back. Okay, so, so we're, we're hoping that that happens. Um, we'll, ha we'll have to wait and see. Um, the, the governor has in the past only given one run, but there's also an option of more than one run. So we'll see what happens there. Um, the XQ grant, um, just an update with that. As, as you know, we have uh, applied for the first level of the XQ grant and we have been accepted and we are now moving on to the second um, of level of the XQ grant. And this is a grant that will, um, is created and is to support the unique kind of strategies used within high schools. And so if we're, we're looking and we're highlighting some of the components of our strategic plan and how they may be implemented into the high school and uh, we are using our strategic plan as our application. And so we'll have to look and see um, whether or not we're gonna, we're gonna, we continue on past number two or the second part of it, which is presently being written. 
and um, if we do, then we have to really look at the grant and what the requirements are and make sure that that's the direction we want to go. Um, I did have the opportunity of listening to a webinar this Saturday that was created by the XQ group. And um, I can tell you that I was pleased because it was, it was something that was very educational. It was, more, it was simply based on what we can do to enhance American education. And there didn't seem to be any negative components within it. So um, I thought that the, the focus and the trends and what they're looking at is, is worthwhile. So that's good news. Um, for those of you who may not have heard, um, our school, our high school, uh, Haldane High School, was nominated by the New York State Education Department for a Blue Ribbon School Potential Award, um, which is given by the U.S. Department of Education. The, the New York State, which is, this is the first time I have heard about it, has actually nominated schools to become Blue Ribbon schools. Um, there are 19 schools whether they be elementary, middle, or high school, that was recommended and nominated. And so um, we're very excited that the, the 19 finalists have now gone to the U.S. Department of Education, and we are going to begin to apply for it. Um, there's an application process that we're starting, and Julie is helping us with that, and also the XQ grant. And so um, that's in the process. We will find out. We, first of all, we have to make AYP and everything in order to continue with the process, um, which we're not overly worried about. We, that will happen. And uh, then we're going to find out probably in August if we're moving on and then um, in the fall if we became a Blue Ribbon School or if we become a Blue Ribbon School. So that's coming. Um, recently, and I know Jen, you asked about the tabletop drills. Um, as part of our safety plan, one of the things that we've been doing, and we've actually done two tabletop drills this year, where we bring in um, the safety representative from Putnam Northern Westchester BOCES, Mike Sellett, and he has come in twice and done tabletop drills for us. The first time, it was just the administrators, and then there was a request that we kind of spread it out and bring in all support personnel. So the most recent tabletop drill, um, basically what you have is you, you have a group of people that come in and you're given a scenario, and you don't know what the scenario is going to be. And the, once the, the scenario is explained, it kind of evolves throughout the day or throughout the two or three hour period. Um, and then you have to figure out how to handle it. So the most recent one was a student um, passed out in the boys' room. And you find the student on the floor. You don't know what happened. You don't know the circumstances around it. You walk in, and things kind of unroll. And then as you're talking about what would be your, your first step and what would be your second and who would be doing what, um, then more information gets um, explained or gets put into the equation and then you continue on and make a determination. So it was about a three hour uh, drill that we went through and you know it, sometimes it gets a little bit bigger than life because you can add whatever you want into it but it's it's a good way of trying to figure out who would do what and how the management would occur and and what um, what the requirements are and learn a little bit about the laws and so um, that's what we did in the last one. So is that? Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. I know you had some questions yeah. about that. I just want to pause you because we're going to change the okay. tape. Thank you. Um, so we've also recently um, held two coffees um, where we invited parents in and we talked a little bit about the, the new instructional initiatives that are happening um, within the district and the creation of um, deeper learning strategies and project-based learning and making things more realistic and more authentic for kids. And um, I can tell you that we had a small group, I think four parents at the first one. Um, we, we tripled that for the second one. Um, but one of the interesting components of it, 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 it both, in both situations, I had parents that said, once they realized what we were doing and once they realized um, the complexities and, and understood what it meant for deeper learning, um, both times I was asked, how can we make sure that this continues to happen? And so um, I, my response was, please get other parents to come in and be part of the conversation. Um, if this was something that really resonated with you, let people know so the next time we offer it, and we will offer another one, 
um, we can get some more parents in so they really understand the concept of really authentic based learning and really increasing the level of understanding and and um, just the the instructional practices that are going throughout the district and so we will invite you again and we hope that you can will take us up on it and come join us um, we also had a community leaders meeting tonight our second meeting um, this is we launched this in the late fall and now we're continuing on with about every other month we will host a community leaders meeting and it's one where the community um, personnel or people that are joining us um, they can ask questions or we can share information we can get it out there and make sure everybody understands exactly what is happening here and if there's any information that we're not sharing they can let us know so that was it was well attended even with the cold weather tonight so we appreciate everybody coming out uh, we have a building and grounds committee coming up um, tomorrow and for those people that may have an interest in understanding what we're doing um, with the Building and Grounds Committee, we did have a building condition survey uh, that was done this year. Um, and we had a representative come in and tell us, based on um, what we have done in the past and where we're going, what types of things we should be considering for projects or um, for enhancements. And um, we will be talking about what our next steps are there. So if you have an interest in being part of that, please let us know. It, it's tomorrow at uh, 3 o'clock in Mabel Merritt. And the last, oh, no, two more, Communities of Care Coalition. We have a meeting next Wednesday at 3 o'clock if anybody would like to join us at the firehouse. And um, we have our business meeting coming up Tuesday, February 2nd, and we'll continue to talk about the budget. So if you have an interest, please join us for any of those. Great. Um, the committee minutes, so we're skipping down to letter F here. Committee minutes, um, there are the Haldane Arts Booster Club minutes and the Haldane Safety Committee minutes for anyone to uh, peruse. Um, is there any communication from the public? Does anybody have any questions, comments? Okay. Moving into consent agenda minutes. May I have a motion, please? Can I ask a question about the safety committee? Sure. Yes, ma'am. Um, the, the whole part about, can you just explain to me where the issues are with the pedestrian traffic and the foot traffic that's an issue? I, I couldn't figure out from here where, where the intersection is that the problem is. Is it two intersections? Actually, I mean, we have Mr. Piazza here. Oh, yes. Do you want to? Can, I, can sure. we put you on the spot? <laughs> sure. Deputy Piazza is one of the uh, safety committee chairs, um, so he can speak to your question. Good evening. Uh, we were specifically talking about the intersection uh, between Craigside and Mountain Ave and Locust. So out on that side of the property. So on yes. the other side of the playground? Yes. So Craigside comes out onto Mountain Ave there. Our school buses make a left and then a right mm -hmm. to go down the one way on Locust. Right. There's a couple issues going on out there. Some poor signage from the town, some confusion from some parents, uh, a lot of people in a rush all the time, uh, which all does not really go well with pedestrian traffic. So in the days that I can, I have to go out there and, and try to make sure everybody's crossing safely. There's not enough crosswalks there. So in fact, just today we met with the Village of Cold Spring to see if we can get that cleaned up a little bit. All right, I didn't realize that was still called Craigside over there. And I yeah, a lot of people out, are confused. I it, it used to. It, connected. <laughs> it used to be all one road at, at some point in history, but yes, it's still called Craigside. So it's just up there. There's nothing down here that's an issue. Uh, the well, top I know part. that there's a. Uh, yeah. No. There's nothing at this side. It's, it's all the other They're talking about end. where the buses exit. Got hmm. it. Okay. Okay. And other buses do a little do 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 to go out, and then there's people. <laughs> right. At all okay. those. Thank you. Points. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Consent agenda minutes. May I have a motion, please? Motion. Second. Any discussion? We're um, talking about the minutes of the Board of Education meeting held on January 5th, 2016. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Consent agenda, financial. May I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Great. Is there any discussion? Oh, uh, 
And I was going to ask you if you could share the donation from the box tops. Um, I think just a reminder of how people can get in on that if they'd like to. Sure. You um, clip your box top labels that are on many different products. Um, your cereal boxes. Cereal your boxes. Your gummies. Your Kleenex box. Your Kleenex. I, you know, I'm opening up my Kleenex box today, and there it was. <laughs> so um, you can just send those in with your student. Um, even the staff, you can send them in to the person that uh, handles this. It's Andrea Saunders. It's uh, a project to gather all of these box tops, and she sends them in. And, and this is a, a generous check that we have now that we're accepting. It's over, I think it's over $500 for this one. But um, at home, you take your labels, send them in with your student. They um, can hand them in to their homeroom teacher, and we'll make sure that they get to the right place. So super easy, just takes that extra step. Awesome. Okay. Um, this is nice. This, this, mm -hmm. So what, this, a third grader wrote, won an award, which won a whole trip for the whole grade. That's nice. The third grader's a rock star. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Consent agenda personnel, may I have a motion, please? A motion. Second. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, going into unfinished business, um, so we're talking about the approval of the 2016-17 budget development calendar. We uh, almost approved this last meeting and then Ann said, wait, <coughs> approve it next meeting because that's what it says on the calendar. So um, is there any further uh, question about it or should we uh, go for it? Everybody good? Okay. Who would you like to the recommended action is that the Board of Education approves the 2016-17 Haldane Central School District Budget Development Calendar as presented. I have a motion, please. I'll make the motion. Second. <laughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Very good. Is there any uh, further communication from the public? Can we just go over yeah. the, the dates? These exec we I know we got a bunch of executive sessions. We got yeah. some, just go over the calendar. Yep. I don't know if I have the calendar anywhere in front of me. No, if we don't have it. I actually don't have it in front of me. Available, of then I can, we can have Linda send it out tomorrow. But yeah, with, with the exec the sessions and like the early, like, so well, February 2nd. So February 2nd, we have a, Go ahead. I don't, what is it? We have something at 6, right? Are we doing an exec? No? No? No, no, no. The, the 5 to 7 ret mini retreat yeah. is the 23rd of February. Okay. So February. And that's to discuss the um, personnel issues. So that's to discuss the different interim positions that are going on right now and to check in with those. I had that as the second, as second also. Am I wrong? I, we better clarify. Okay. Something is I have that as the second also. The second is our, um, no, I don't, I don't have that as the second. But I also don't really have it in front of me. I'm yeah, I, th I think memory. it was part, I think Linda included it on with the Friday mm -hmm. um, reflection, but we can send it again so we can all clarify. Sorry, I don't have that in front of me anywhere. Yep, I'll we'll have Linda send it tomorrow. Okay. So, uh, okay. The second, the important thing about next, on um, the second, is that we're going to be discussing our goals. Okay. Um, that's, and that's during public session. That's a, a That's regular like time? regular 7 o'clock time. Okay. During public so, session. So we don't have anything scheduled before well, on the second. Well, Linda's going to confirm that. Okay. All right. Would you, okay. What did you, you thought it was, Margaret? Or? I had the mini retreat from 5 to 6, and then a board of ed meeting from 7 to 8 is what I had written in. I don't know why. Yeah, I think that was changed. Okay. But we'll, but we'll clarify. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Can I make a motion to adjourn? 
Uh, motion. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Thank you, everyone.